I don't think it's a mistake that uh, dystopian fiction and television hit a peak during one of the most stable, open-minded cultural period. It's okay to be afraid when the real world isn't scary. When the real world gets really scary, that's you want something that teaches you how to be a hero. Hello and welcome to Culturescape, the show that interviews the creators and influencers that built your culture. Today I have with me the wonderful Jane Linskold, a fantasy author mentored by the amazing Hugo Award winning author Roger Zelesny, with her own long pedigree of books and projects throughout different facets of the fantasy genre. Jane is here to talk about some of her latest books, including the Overware series and A New Clan, which she collaborated on with David Weber. Jane will share with us her insights into the craft and business of writing, her influences and inspirations, and what it takes to be an author in this day and age. Uh, welcome to the show, Jane. Thank you very much, Peter. Happy to be here. Awesome. Uh, I found it very interesting when I was uh, researching you and trying to figure out, you know, your work and history that you have uh, a interesting relationship with a pretty famous author, well, you know, one of the greats from the mid-century. Right? Right? Roger, I assume you mean? Yes, yes, Mr. Zelazny. Uh, I'm fascinated to hear, hear that story. Like, how did you, how did you meet him? What was that relationship like? Well, let's see. Um... In the mid-late 1980s, I was working in my PhD at Fordham University, and I was in a bookstore, and I came across a choose-your-own-adventure novel, uh, The Black Road, by Roger Zelazny and somebody else. And to my, I was a big fan of Roger's Amber series and a lot of his other work, and I thought, and I'm going to be completely honest here. I thought, well, if he's going to do that kind of crap, um, maybe <laughs> I could get in touch because uh, I've always felt like the Amber novels have the potential to have a sideline pulled from the point of view of a couple of the other characters who I think are undervalued. So I wrote him a very nice, you know, polite query letter. He sent me back a postcard telling me he had plans for the characters, which in fact, uh, soon after the new, uh, the second Amber series would, would get started. And, but uh, my mama always taught me that if someone's polite enough to, uh, reply to one of your letters, you reply to one of theirs. So I sent him a thank you note, that, uh, and he sent me a note and I sent him a note and well, it's now a correspondence that fills an entire, uh, drawer. Uh, we met in person for the first time in, I think it was 1989, at a Lunacon in Terrytown, New York. And it was sort of uh, instant best friend. Um, and one thing and another led. And we talked just a lot in letters and then later phone calls and later in person about writing. I was coming from the background of a long time science fiction and fantasy reader, but also a uh, newly minted PhD. And he was coming from the background of somebody who had been writing for years, but also had the academic background. Um, he'd uh, done a master's in English. So we had a lot in common, and it worked out very well. Eventually, we ended up uh, transitioning into a personal relationship, and I was living with him when he died. Wow. Now, he died pretty, uh, relatively young, if I remember correctly. He was 58, yeah, a month after his 58th birthday. Oh, awful. That, that is a really interesting relationship, and it all came about because you just decide you wanted to write him about your, your criticisms of one of his books. But that says a lot about him. I mean, I didn't, I, I told him later what I thought, and it didn't threaten him. Um what I lear later learned was that she had a tremendous amount of curiosity about different forms of storytelling. And although he wasn't a gamer, he loved the idea of the choose your own adventure, which at that point, remember, this is computer games aren't really a uh -huh. thing. They're still, you know, 
things like adventure on the Atari. So uh, the idea of a, a story that a person could sit down and read and depending on the choices they made would be how the story would unfold really fascinated him as a master storyteller. And it's kind of, you know, if I wrote this in a novel, people would say, oh man, that's the hokiest coincidence in the world. But uh, when he died, the project we were working on together was a computer game uh, called Chrono Master. And, uh, and one of the things that, again, that fascinated him was setting up a story that other people would then be able to play through and depending on their choices would unfold. So it all sort of came very oddly full circle. Yeah, that's it's a pretty amazing uh, connection you have there. It's funny because today, uh, you know, with most creators, it seems like if there's even the smallest amount of criticism, a uh, great many people will just, you know, block them, ban them, uh, ignore them. I think people take it very personally too these days. I I don't know why that is, but you know, Zelensky he came from that generation where they still had that great sense of professionalism. It sounds like overall he was a he was a pretty nice person to be able to take that and try to to build upon it with you. I, I think that's a really uh, neat story. I, I don't know if we have that same kind of caliber of writers where they're just as good as they are people as they are writing their fiction. Well, I think there are. But I think it depends on the type of critique. I mean, I was basically coming to Roger with, hey, if you're done enough with this series that you are farming it out, I've got a really cool idea that would expand upon what you've done. I wasn't telling him that his Amber series wasn't fantastic. I was telling him that I thought it was fantastic and had the potential to blossom out and become something more than it already was. And I suspect that if he'd lived longer, I might actually have gone ahead and written those novels that we, I originally approached him about or, uh, or collaborated with him on it because he was very fascinated with alternate forms of storytelling. Interesting. Tell us a little bit more about yourself, Jane. How did you become an author? What was kind of the, the road that you traveled becoming a fantasy author working as a professional? Sure. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I basically uh, have three degrees in English literature, ma bachelor's, master's, PhD, all from Fordham University. And I did my degrees really fast. I defended my doctoral dissertation on my 26th birthday. And when I finished my writing my dissertation and it went to my committee to be revered before the defense, I thought about how life takes up space. Um, and I'd had all this time that I dedicated to writing my dissertation. I decided I always wanted to write fiction. Now was the time to settle down and start writing fiction um, while I was, you know, while, while I was waiting to finish off my degree work. And I did, and I promptly started collecting rejection letters. I'm going to be completely honest. It would be years before I would sell anything. I had a tremendous amount to learn about the field, about marketing, about uh, submitting works, etc. But it was essentially, I was, I had always wanted to write. Um, I don't know if you know an author named Charles E. Gannon, Chuck Gannon, but, uh, we knew each other back in the day. He used to be part of my role-playing game group when I was still an undergraduate. Oh, that and, is interesting. Yeah, and Chuck and I always, both always wanted to write. Uh, and when I finished my doctoral work, that was, I took the time that had been working on a PhD and put it into working on writing fiction. Uh, so that's the beginning of the path. I finished up my degree work. I got a job teaching English literature and writing at a small college in South Central Virginia called Lynchburg College. Very nice people. And I continued to pursue writing stories, collecting rejection letters, writing stories until 
finally, uh, they started selling. Uh, my first short story was sold to a small magazine called Star Shore that went under like one issue later. Then I sold a story to an anthology called Dragon Fantastic. And then, you know, a chunk of time went by and I didn't sell anything. But gradually, I kept plugging at it. And uh, eventually, I was selling more than I was getting rejected. I began to write novels. Uh, and all of this in my spare time while I was teaching college full time. Um, I had five classes, five preparations. I was a new professor, so it was a lot, a lot of work. Uh, yeah, I could see, I could see that that would that would keep you pretty busy. Yeah, and then we move, run the camera forward to uh, 1994. My first marriage was disintegrating badly, and by then Roger was one of my best friends, and I mentioned to him that at the end of that term. I was planning on change, you know, I would be looking for a new job. I would be moving somewhere else. And he said, what do you think about coming here and coming to me? And I said, sure. So I finished up the year I was teaching, packed up, and uh, in the course of shutting down one life and getting ready to move to another, Roger found out he had cancer. But I, so I moved in with him knowing full well what we were up against. And unfortunately, we didn't win. Uh, he died almost, almost exactly a year after I moved out. And that was incredibly hard. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, that would be very difficult. But it's good, though, that he had a friend and someone that he, uh, felt close to that was there for him but I know I'm sure that was a very difficult experience for you it was but I, it was where I want I wouldn't have wanted to be anywhere else I mean you know you don't love somebody and then uh, dodge out as soon as the going gets tough you just don't did that experience do you think it, it helped influence you as a person or as a writer do you think having the experience of dealing with someone that was going through the stages of death do you think you know that changed your outlook not just like as a as a professional you know your fiction how you approach what you're writing and your understanding of it but also like in your own life i know because traumatic events often seem to they seem to be a, a core part of what makes a really great writer well they, it, it did impact me in a lot of ways um for one thing i was only 33 at the time uh, 32, actually, when Roger died. And it made me really think about priorities. I very much, I was a professional writer by then. I My first novel had come out uh, that, that December, and my second novel came out, I think, shortly before Roger died. Um, but it really made me think about priorities. I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to write the best possible stuff that I could. And at the same time, I was lucky enough that I tumbled almost by accident into a new relationship. And I was determined that that was not going to be something that got lower priority. Um, so I, unless I'm working, I take weekends off to spend with my husband and, uh, you know, if there's, yeah. And also, to be honest, I don't do any work I don't want to do. Um, because my dad, uh, my dad was hit in his early sixties with Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, you can't, I, in my opinion, I didn't ever want to be working on a project just for the money without any love um, and then find out it was my turn to have the rub pulled out from under me. So everything I've done one way or another, even if it's been uh, an invitation to an anthology or whatever, I found a way to make it a passion project. That seems, that does seem like a, a, a good life lesson takeaway. You know, we only have so much time. 
uh, I guess it's easy, you know, even for my own work to get caught in just trying to, you know, meet pitches to, you know, earn a living. And that's pretty normal for people. I like what you also said uh, earlier where you talked about tr getting used to getting so many rejection letters. And I think that's a, a hard part for a lot of people who start working in writing projects. It's just, I there was a, a survey probably a year ago where they were looking at freelance writers and ask you, so what percentage of the time, how many pitches are you putting up before you succeed? And they found that, you know, it was somewhere usually around between 80 to 90% of all pitches they were sending out. These are professionals that worked in journalism or they've been copy editors or what have you for many years, and you're still getting rejected the vast majority of time. Yeah, I still get rejections, not as often, um, but... They still happen, and they're not a lot of fun. When I left teaching college, I had a folder in my desk where I'd kept every rejection letter I'd gotten, and it was literally, you know, like this thick. And I looked at it, and I thought, do I want to bring this with me and someday be able to say, ha-ha, or do I want to just ditch it and view my life as something I'm going forward from? And I, I ditched them because I didn't want to be looking back. I didn't want to be dwelling on anger or resentment or I'll show you someday. I wanted my work to be for me. Um, and I'll, and that's been a good approach. Doesn't mean I don't get angry if I get a rejection. And going back to your comment about people who can't take criticism, I think there's valuable criticism and non-valuable criticism. Uh, I once submitted a novel to an editor who arbitrarily decided that I had in it, I had a winged lion. And he arbitrarily decided that it would be much better if the winged lion had something to do with the winged lions of Venice. And I was like, what? You're just arbitrarily putting your idea into my book where it doesn't fit? And I told him, Thank you very much, but I'm not interested in working with you. To me, that wasn't valuable criticism, but I've worked with some wonderful editors who, and who let me see something that I wouldn't have seen, or even a reader who might say, I really like this character and I'm interested in where that character might be going. And I tuck that in the back of my head. Now, so it's, it, but arbitrary criticism that is, meant to try and run your life for you. I guess you're seeing an abiding theme here. I'm not interested in anyone else running my life. Um, and if somebody got in touch with me and said, Jane, I think your Overwear series would be a whole lot better if uh, there were a race of people who looked like bananas because, you know, you are completely <laughs> missing the point. The bananas are very, very important. And let me tell you why. Um, I would not feel that was valid criticism. My ideas are not, you know, are you familiar with Socrates? I and, am, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, well, one of the things that Socrates talks about is that people aren't equal and everybody's opinion is not the equivalent of everybody else's opinion. Uh, one of the examples is, you know, going to an expert because you want a perfect statue or painting or set of armor. Well, I think the same thing goes for any form of expertise. We aren't all equal. And so somebody saying, well, my ideas are automatically as good as yours are because we're all equal. Uh, not necessarily true. I think that's a little hard for people right now in this day and age because the proliferation of social media, I think the the cultural understanding of values is different. Socrates, among what he's trying to put out there, is like not all ideas have equal weight or equal value. It just because you hear from one expert and you hear from another expert, that doesn't mean that they're right, like those ideas in their value or potential for doing good is the same. 
you know, we have that kind of problem in society today where we kind of want to put in our heads, like all cultures are of equal value or, um, all creative endeavors are of equal value. That isn't the case. It sounds like to me though, Jane, that as an author that you, you do, you are okay with collaboration and working with other partners, but it feels like you want to stay the captain of the ship. Do I have that about right for you? If it's my solo project, yes. But for example, my work with David Weber is the exact opposite. We're writing in his honor verse. And from the moment I accepted working with him, I also accepted that he had the final say because it was a universe he had created. And it was very important that we stay true to his voice. And not just his voice, but what he had established elsewhere, even stuff that wasn't yet written. What we're doing together are prequels uh, set. Oh, his main storyline deals with Honor Harrington and a very established Star Kingdom of Manticore. The books we're doing, the Star Kingdom of Manticore is newly established. The planet most of our books are set on is barely been colonized. So there are times we really have to balance. I might have some great idea and he has to come in and say, no, that's not going to work because the ramifications carrying that forward to honors time, it won't work. And I say, okay, this is, you understand the larger weave of the tapestry much better than I do. I'll back off. So, um, so no, I can, I can work with someone else in their universe and, and not be captain of the ship, um, as long as I don't feel that, and Weber never leaves me feeling this way, that I'm just uh, writing down his ideas. The fantasy genre is kind of in a weird place right now. I think we are seeing this at least in the the world of um, consumer entertainment. So uh, we've seen shows like The Rings of Power or we've seen the adaptation of The Wheels of Time. It does seem like there is some interest in a fantasy genre. But then, on the other hand, it, and a friend was remarking this to me when he was looking at like um, how Wizards of the Coast was trying to handle the Dragonlance novel series and basically was was uh taking a butcher knife to it because it didn't fit the modern day it feels like fancy although it's pop it's like really popular on on the blockbuster level it seems like in the book area things have been better in the past where do you feel like the fancy genre is right now not just in terms of of health like how well it's doing in the market but just like where it fits in the popular zeitgeist I don't know. Um, I'd love to be able to give you a, a proper scholarly answer to that. Um, I don't think there's ever been one book to rule the law, one book to bind them, one way to do it. Um, if we have a problem right now, it is that too many of the publishing houses have been bought by large conglomerates that think you can sell books like you sell shoes, uh, find one popular model and keep churning it out. When the reality is even the same book speaks differently to different people. A good example of that for me is I have an acquaintance who we have never yet liked the same book. And then one day we finally both found a book that we liked, that we were both excited because we had wanted to both like the same book. Turned out my favorite scene in the book was her least favorite, and her least favorite scene in the book was my favorite. So same book, book we both like, whatever. So I think probably if print literature is facing any challenge, it is the fact that there is an unrealistic idea that there is one flavor and that then when we find that one flavor, we should churn out as much of it as possible. Um, and quite frankly, not even, not even authors want to write the same thing all the time. Uh, one of the things that made Rogers such a phenomenon in his time is that 
He wrote everything from adventure, sword, and sorcery to some very experimental surrealist pieces to a novel he wrote with a friend where one half of it was in epic verse. Um, but if we have a problem in the marketplace today is it's an attempt to believe that there can only be one one story and we just need to find it. And I don't think that works. I largely agree with you because I think I were seeing this where it feels like to the big companies that fantasy in particular, but this is true of a lot of the genres, that they're very they're just like interchangeable. You know, it doesn't really matter. I think this is best explained right now. Amazon during the writer's strike. They have Rings of Power, which is their very expensive show. It didn't do so well in its first season. And the right, the show isn't finished. They haven't um, got all they need for filming. But the writer's strike is on. So the writers can't be there. And the the showrunners, so the producers can't be there either. But Amazon says, oh, just go ahead and film it anyway. Just, use, just take what you have and just film it anyway. This is like, which is kind of like telling me like, oh, just use whatever old thing has come to hand. doesn't really matter. It's, it's the fantasy genre, right? Anyone could do that. And it's actually much harder to write science fiction or fantasy than it is to write anything else because in science fiction or fantasy, you have to create reality. Uh, whereas a mystery uh, is set in our consensual reality, whatever is consensual, um, whether, you know, it's Victorian London and you can go and research what's there or early 20th century or whatever. There is a reality that those are set in. But science fiction and fantasy is not easier. It's harder than any other genre to write in. Yeah, and then if you if you do try to treat it as more generic or, or you can just be lazy in the world building, I mean, that's very apparent to people. Especially people who oh, are yeah. fans of sci-fi or fantasy, but even to general audiences, where they're maybe they can't put a finger on why this production doesn't work, but they're just like this is kind of bland. This doesn't seem to have a lot of meat on this bone. No, I'm agreeing with you. Readers are smart. Readers are smart, and they're going to notice uh, and incongruity. They're going to notice a bad bit of world building. They're going to notice a weak foundation. I'm reading a novel right now that I'm very much enjoying, but there's one elephant in the room that's so enormous that I'm waiting to find out if the fact that no one has noticed the elephant in the room is actually a plot point or whether the author didn't realize it was such an obvious elephant in the room. Uh, I'm kind of fascinated halfway through the book. Uh, so, yeah, uh, and viewers these days with the ability to uh, record and micro watch something. There are people out there who will watch a TV show frame by frame and then post continuity errors they find. Um, I think Amazon is making a mistake in thinking that no one will care. They will. No, definitely. I agree. Um one of the interesting things we're seeing now with the rise of large language models in chat GPT, speaking of Amazon, is that this is a story just from the last week that their uh, self-publishing bookstore that they have on Amazon is just being flooded with uh, chat GPT or similar AI generated novels. And that this is a real concern I've heard from some people because they fear that the, the market, especially for people who are up and comers or people who just you know, maybe their career is middling, they don't have a lot of attention, but they have a very dedicated small fan base, how all this is going to push them out. Do you have any, do you share any of these concerns? Do you have a feeling for what the future might hold for the fantasy genre and fiction writing in general with all the changes we are seeing in the world of tech? Uh, no, I don't have enough knowledge. I do <laughs> think that uh, writers I think readers are going to quickly catch on when it's a piece of garbage put together by a chatbot and stop reading it. And it may actually, in an optimistic view, it could be very good for a writer like myself, who's been a full-time writer for since 1994, and people can go, Jane Linskold, I can trust it. 
it's a real person, whether it's one of her indie pub works or something that's coming in out of a New York publisher, I'm going to go, I'm not going to take a risk on, you know, Lion of Darkness um, by Joan Smith, who might be a chatbot. I'm going to go to the people I know and I trust. Uh, so it may, it may hurt a newbie, but I don't think it will hurt established writers. And I think if a newbie is good, it's not going to hurt them either. That, that's that's a more positive, optimistic outlook. I think you are probably correct, at least when it comes to people who are more established. The, all the authors that you said earlier with these big book publishing companies, and they basically want to put out one sort of novel and just you know make 5,000 of them. That kind of stuff is not going to hold as much cultural relevancy. They're going to really struggle to find a target. Whereas people who have more original writing, who have an established history of writing, like yourself, that is really, I think, that, um, uh, you know, people can trust that. I think you're correct in that way. It will be interesting to see if there is a renewed interest in the fantasy genre. I think we've seen a lot of stuff coming from, you know, huge, monumental, colossal-sized authors like G.R.R. Martin. I, I, you know, he had such a success, of course, the original Game of Thrones, and then, of course, he now has his spin-off House the Dragon. So I think there are people who are really hungry. They're salivating for really well-crafted fiction, especially like in fantasy sci-fi. But maybe there's not a, you know, maybe there's a missing part in the pipeline to connect people like yourself to those authors. And I wonder in this new chat GBT world we're entering that that hole is going to be fixed. But it will, it will be interesting to see. I, I'm, genu I'm genuinely curious what is going to happen to the writing profession here out. I'm not one of these people who are super negative. That's like, this is the end of everything. <laughs> you know, people are just never going to bother with, bother with writing ever again. I'm more like you. I'm more up with someone that sees this as a, as a positive change. And just like we're learning to adjust social media, we'll learn to adjust with this too. I think so. And I also think that I've been doing this for a long time, and let's keep in mind that the indie pub revolution is a really small window. Um, maybe 10 years max, if we're really optimistic, that people could bypass having to build credentials and just drop their stuff out there and hope that they built a readership. I think it's very important to note that a lot of the people who have been successful indie pub authors often give away books for free, often make, do not make very much money doing what they're doing. The ones who do make a living at it uh, very often are writing formulaic romance novels, etc. Um, and they work because their readership says, I want to know, I will be happy today. I will be I will get, you know, Rose, Rose, Roses, lovely romance novel, and I will know there will be this amount of trauma, and then at the end it'll be a happy ending. But uh, that's not what science fiction and fantasy readers are necessarily looking for. Um, I But what happened in there was when Amazon set up, there was an awful lot of people who said, I'm really tired of collecting this many rejection letters to sell one short story for $58. I'm going to just put my stuff out on Amazon. They didn't build credentials. They didn't build a background. And that's who, they're the ones who are going to be very vulnerable. Whereas when I got started, you didn't have that option. You shipped out your stories. You paid your postage. You gradually built a bibliography. I know you're on a really busy schedule, so you probably didn't get a chance to look at my bibliography. But if you look at it, you'll see that before my first short, my first novel came out, I was building a track record with short stories. That's what helped me get my agent. That's what helped me prove, yes, this person can do it. But there were a lot of people out there who took advantage of the IndiePub platform to toss out their 
beginner work and hope they'd catch an audience. And they're the ones who never built uh, credentials that then they can fall back on and say, no, really, you know, I've sold stories to all of these anthologies. You can trust me. I know what I'm doing. No, and there's there's something to say for climbing the ladder. And uh, this is a problem we have in, in many of these industries that are really struggling, like my industry, journalism. It's, it's not just that there are less jobs, it's that the ladder that was once there where like you start at a small local outlet or a TV news station, whatever, you work hard and then you slowly make your way to bigger and better outlets. And you know, maybe you'll meet a mentor, you'll make a mentor kind of like you had with Zelezny. And this people, this person is gonna show you the ropes. And so slowly as you work through your career, you learn how to do all this stuff. The problem with this, this where we kind of are right now, it's like, if you're just self-publishing, yeah, you can get your book out. But on the downside, you don't have that person that's right there guiding you and say, hey, this is what works, here's what doesn't and why. Yeah, and to be honest, um, I do not read a lot of material, but that isn't already published or at least already accepted for publication. But every so often, uh, oh, I might, you know, do a favor for a niece or a nephew or something, uh, or I judge for a contest or whatever. And the number of times I've looked at something and told someone it needs more work. And they get frustrated and just go ahead and indie pub it because they don't want. They believe in their vision. They don't understand that when someone like, you know, someone from the 1980s who talks about, I believed in myself and I didn't change anything. They collected a lot of rejection and learned a lot from that process. Um, they didn't toss I, I certainly didn't publish my first several novels or my first, I have a three inch binder, you know, that's about like this, full of unpublished short fiction. That was my learning experience. Today, people would say, it's good enough. I'll put yep. it out there, 99 cents, and I'll make some money on it and I'll get some ego boo. I hear you, my my good friend Vito, who just started a, a fairly successful um, Kickstarter for a comic, kind of what inspired him to work on that project was like, you see a lot of these comics that are doing very well in the Kickstarter space, you know, and sometimes these things are bringing in 10,000, 30,000, 100,000 or more. And it's like, wow, this is really awesome. We have some independent people working in the comic sphere. This proves there's an audience for all this. All this is great. Then you, the comic comes out. <laughs> And then you read it, and it's just utter dog crap. It's like, oh my gosh, this is terrible. <laughs> and yeah. I agree, I agree with you because it's like, it's not just enough to feel like your your project is successful because it has somewhat of audience. Like you as a professional, you as someone that actually loves the fantasy genre, you don't just want your book to be good because you know other people might like it. You want the book to be good because you believe this project is of high quality. And I think another thing is that there's a good place, a good space for indie pub, often for books that really wouldn't fit a publisher's niche. I did this with my uh, short novel, Asphodel. It's very surreal. It was my, my, my magical realism book. And my agent said, this is brilliant, but it's really weird. Um, I can probably find a small press for it. And I said, don't bother. I don't want anyone to file the square corners off my book to fit it. This one is meant to be weird. And I think that there's a really good place in indie pub if you're reaching to write something that isn't going to fit into any publisher's stream. But it doesn't mean it can be weaker. It has to be stronger to really, to really stand out. And there are, I was on a panel a couple of weeks ago with an editor who mentioned that um, some books like uh, the recent hit Legends and Lattes start as a self-publishing phenomenon and then gets picked up by a professional publisher like Tor because they think they can make money on it. I mean, she was pretty blunt about it. Uh, but Legends and Lattes is really good. It's not a case of a sloppy work being picked up. It's a case of 
a really well-groomed work being picked up. But if you're going to write, you know, Game of Thrones and call it, uh, you know, your, your version of Game of Thrones, at no originality, uh, George is a very good writer. Um, and what people overlook is what a long track record he had before he became an overnight success. He's also run, won the Hugo and the Nebula and the World Fantasy Award long before he broke out into the larger consciousness with Game of Thrones. He's not a young writer. One of the comments I was listening to uh, in your view, uh, no, you were you were at a book conference or like a, a book celebration affair, and you made the comment about how so many people, they get caught up about thinking about, am I a success? Am I too old to do this? And your advice, which I thought was very uh, positive and useful, is like, no, it's like you're never quite too old to start working on these things. If you want to be an author and you have a good idea, go for it. That, I love that idea. I love that concept. Uh, what What are some of the things when you were starting out, even now as a writer, what, what are some of the things you feel like they get in the way of people that want to, to be a writer but feel like they cannot do it? And how would you get over those? All right. One thing I think gets in the way of people is they start thinking of themselves as an author, not a writer. I love that you use the word writer because you're getting down to the roots of it. Putting words down in a organized fashion. They, I have met young writers who are already thinking of themselves as authors. They have websites. They have, they're trying to build a readership. They haven't finished anything. They corner you at a convention and tell you happily about their idea for a wonderfully brilliant five-volume series. And you say, that's really terrific. How much have you written? Oh, well, I haven't started it yet, but I'm drawing all the maps. So one of the things I think gets in the way is thinking too much about being an author and too little about the actual act of writing. Um, I think that every I wrote a book on writing called Wanderings on Writing, and on the cover of it, it has a very silly looking dragon with a golden key around it neck because too many people believe there's a golden key that's going to make you a best-selling writer overnight and the introduction to the book says there is no golden key what this book is is a bunch of essays that might help you build your own toolkit but there is no golden key but instead they don't write they keep searching for uh how to become a product, not how to be a writer. And I wrote my first several novels while, as I said, teaching college full-time, five courses, five preps. I was teaching English composition, so I was grading something like 500 papers a term just for my composition courses. That didn't count the literature courses I was teaching, and I still wrote every day <laughs> that's a lot of work there's a lot of dedication to do that but that's what that's what gets in the way is people believe there's a fast way an easy way but whatever publishing platform you choose still every one of those people who really sat down and they wrote their hundred thousand words or the eighty thousand words or whatever has my respect because they've already separated themselves from the herd by parking their butt in a chair or talking into a microphone or whatever format they use, but they actually sat down and worked hard at the process of composition. They may not have done all the polishing, but right there, they've cut themselves out of the herd. Yeah, it doesn't really matter what you're doing. You're, you're really not going to get ahead if you just don't do the homework. I mean, it costs nothing to be a dreamer, but that that doesn't that just because you have a g good idea or you have dreams, that doesn't mean that will automatically turn into a finished, you know, a finished product, a work of art, just because you want it to be there. You have to you have to you know 
put your head to the grindstone, work hard, make it happen. Which is not exactly uh, easy for a lot of us, but there's surely no other way around it. So to start to wrap up things, Jane, what are some of the things that you're interested in right now? Are there any books you're reading or shows you're watching? Um, what what part of fantasy, the genre, really interests you at the moment? Um, I read a lot. So, and I read backwards and I read forwards both. Uh, if, you're in, if any of your readers are interested in what I'm reading, I post it to my blog every week in uh, on, as the Friday Fragments, where I list what I'm reading. Uh, currently, my reading is, I decided to read or reread all of Lois Bujold's or Kosigan saga books in the order in which events happen, uh, because <clears throat> the books were written out of order, and I thought it would be interesting to see how it evolved, and I'm very much enjoying that. Uh, as far as watching, my deep, not-so-dark secret is I've been an anime fan since <laughs> before most people nice. knew what anime was. Um I mean, really, when you had to say, you know, I had things in my collection that were fan dubbed, you know, fan sub. Uh, I've replaced, I think, most of it by now. Wow, uh, but you had to explain it to people. I remember when the very first science fiction convention I went to, which coincidentally was the one where uh, I met Roger, uh, they had an anime room and it consisted of a TV with a VCR and a young Japanese-American man standing next to the TV and doing a simultaneous translation oh, wow. of what was going on. Um, so I'm an anime fan, and, uh, and I love it because there's a different view towards storytelling that comes out of that view. Oddly enough, so I'm not as enchanted with some of the newer stuff because they're being they're trying too hard to hit what they think the American market wants uh -huh. because the American market is much bigger than the Japanese market. I like the I like stuff predating the real burst out of anime in the U.S. Uh, early, you know, early two thousands and maybe forward a bit. Because that that has a whole different cultural sensibility to it. I also liked it because before special effects got really good, most science fiction and fantasy looked a little clumsy. But if everything was animated, then you could have the most outrageous monsters or whatever. Uh, it was all drawn. So for me, that was, was part of the early attraction. So... Right now, I'm watching a, I think, early 2000s science fiction mecha crossed with Shinto mysticism uh, anime called Gasaraki, and it bends your brain in very, very nice ways. And that's what I want from stories. I, I want to have my brain bent, uh, whether it's in print or, or in view. Um, and I guess that's, in a way, what I write as well. Uh, one reason I tend to write a lot of stories with non-humans is because the perception of the other interests me a lot. Probably one reason I married an archaeologist. Uh, yeah. You know, another person who is very interested in different cultural and sociological points of view. I don't want a thinly disguised COVID anxiety tale. Thank you. I did that. I lived that. I don't need to sit down uh -huh. and read that. Take me to another century, set up a different set of parameters, and let's see where we go. I agree with you on both points. I think this is my theory for why the popularity of The Walking Dead plummeted. I think it's because of COVID, because people, just, just dystopian stories just did not quite hit the same you know, pre-2020 and post-2020, I think just the interest in dystopian, like anything, I think that desire has gone down rapidly. Oh, yeah. 
I don't think it's a mistake that uh, dystopian fiction and television hit a peak during one of the most stable, open-minded cultural periods. It's okay to be afraid when the real world isn't scary. When the real world gets really scary, that's you want something that teaches you how to be a hero. Uh, one of the best bits of fan feedback I ever got to, and wherever you are out there, Brooke, I hope you somehow hear it, was from a woman who, young woman who wrote me, judging from her letters, she was a high school or college student. And she told me how she was scared of everything. She was scared of snakes. She was scared of people she couldn't talk to. She was scared. But that summer, she and her mother were going to go on a tour in Europe and as part of a wildlife counting expedition. And she was going to be like my character firekeeper. She was going to be brave. And I felt like, okay, when my, when my coffin closes, when it's the end of days for me, at least one person out there Learn to be brave from something she saw and something I've written. That's that's good. Awesome. That's enough. Yeah, that's pretty special. I wish I wish I had known you were in anime because I would have prepared more anime questions. Well, well, we could do it again sometime. <laughs> okay, well, we'll have to. You're an interesting person, Jane. Uh, former Fordham uh, educated English professor who writes fantasy fiction likes the anime and is married to an archaeologist that's up <laughs> it's a pretty good world isn't it yeah okay well guys i think we're going to wrap it up here thank you so much jane lynn skulls for coming on the program we i really enjoyed talking with you i enjoyed talking with you yeah thank you um you of course where can we find your stuff jade if people want to find you online uh do you have social media and um, you mentioned yeah. your website what's the name of the website website is pretty simple jane and I'm on Facebook and Twitter, and I write a weekly blog. I post, and I've managed to do it faithfully. As a journalist, you'll appreciate this. Every Wednesday and every Friday for a lot of years, like 11 years now, every Wednesday. Oh, wow, that's a really good run. <laughs> yeah. So if you're, you can sign up just for my blog every Wednesday. Right now I'm writing a lot about my garden. Um, but... Uh, so that's where you can find me, Facebook, Twitter, my blog, and my website. That's enough of my time for social media. Okay, fair enough. Well, uh, thank you again to all our listeners. Thank you to my editor, Chris Holowicki, who, without whose help, this show would not be possible. Um, we also thank uh, Young Voices and Bain Publishing, which helped produce the podcast. Until next time, my friends, keep geeking out.